The destiny of Rwanda, which was colonized by Germany in 1897 and later by Belgium in 1916, was finally decided in 1994 forever. It's often said that France had found a short, classic way for solution. The name of that way was genocide. Located in East Central Africa and slightly south of the equator, Rwanda experienced the most devastating genocide of 20th century from April 7 to July 19 in 1994. Hundred days genocide, an estimated 800,000 to 1 billion people lost their lives. while nearly two million others were forced to flee as refugees. Consequently, the country's population experienced a staggering 30% decrease. Why did this genocide happen? What was its purpose? Was it aimed at eradicating the people of Rwanda and re-establishing colonial rule? There are many questions, but there is only one way to get answers. France. The primary objective in Rwanda was to intensify the animosity between the two ethnic groups, the Tutsis and the Hutus, who had coexisted for thousands of years. Exploiting these two groups, who shared the same language and culture, they divided them into tribes and categorized them based on their physical appearances and occupations. By continually spreading discord and orchestrating massacres, they sought to manipulate and control the situation for their own purposes. In 1994, their sinister goals were finally achieved. Over the course of 100 harrowing days, entire villages, countless families and Tutsi communities were mercilessly wiped out, vanishing from the face of Earth. The streets and roads became haunting scenes as lifeless bodies were piled up, transforming the country into an open grave. In 
capital city of Kigali alone, there are six memorial complexes dedicated to preserving the memory of the genocide victims. Among them is the Kigali Memorial Complex, bearing the same name as the city itself, Kigali. Here there are corners dedicated to the hundreds and thousands of murdered and missing children and women. Indeed, these only represent a fraction of this immense tragedy that unfolded during the hundred days period we are discussing. Here, the last garments worn by the victims of the genocides, as well as the clothes they had on at the time of their untimely deaths, are on display. Symbolically, representing the duration of 100 days genocide, this corner houses the schools of 100 individuals. Additionally, heart-rending photographs of the children who lost their lives during the genocide are presented here. The age of these innocent victims range from as young as 2 years old to the eldest at 13 or 14 years old. Within the rose garden courtyard of the complex, there are approximately 10 mass graves. Each of these colossal concrete graves holds the remains of over 1,000 individuals comprising complete bodies, body parts and limbs. Additionally, the identities of human corpses symbolically placed in four coffins remain unknown. France was involved in, um, in instead, I mean, supporting the whole process of genocide in the in the different ways. Um, looking at 1990, when uh, Rwandans by LPF uh, took up arms to fight the regime, uh, France, alongside the Zaïlian troops of the time, came to support the government of Rwanda that had been persecuting its own people and supporting the military. Uh, there was a military um, deployment uh, of French soldiers that was called Operation Norwa. Nyanza Memorial Complex courtyard features mass graves and plaques where Tutsis find solace in inscribing the names of their missing family members and loved ones. These victims, these Tutsi victims who were just killed uh, just because of the way they were created, or the way they were just born. Those people, more than 3,000 people, more than 3,000 Tutsis, were killed on this exact place on the 11th of April in 1994. Uh, there are people who were abandoned by the UN peacekeepers. Specifically, they were Belgian soldiers who were camping at a nearby school called Aiparasi Kigali. At that time, it was called Etokichukiro. So on the 11th of April, uh, these Belgian soldiers were in a peacekeeping mission here in Rwanda. They abandoned these people, leaving them without any help. So, and then the local militia, with the help of government soldiers then, that's when they brought them to be killed to this place. Another harrowing consequence of the Rwandan genocide, an estimated 350,000 to 500,000 women fell victim to the sexual violence during the 100-day period. Many of these women, along with countless others, sought refuge in neighboring countries, with the Goma province of the Democratic Republic of Congo being a prominent destination in their desperate quest for survival. Unbeknownst to them, many of these women became carriers of the devastating disease, AIDS. Additionally, a heart-wrenching reality is that some of these women gave birth to children as a result of rape, and now those children have reached age of 28. We 
have recently located one of the long silent victims after 29 years. Her name is Solane Mukanziyemana, who was just 17 years old during the genocide. In 1994, survival was an immense struggle. The leader of that period was actively arming individuals to carry out the killings of Tutsis. At 8 o'clock in the morning on April 8, the violence began in this area among those killed during that time. My aunts, uncles and brothers also lost their lives, leaving me as the sole survivor. I managed to escape and sought refuge in a nearby neighborhood where a compassionate elderly woman who knew my father hid and protected me. Before that, I sought refuge in a church, but unfortunately, the priest expelled me. While running for my life, I encountered some young men on motorbikes who had just participated in the killings of Tutsis. Fortunately, one of them recognized my father and showed kindness by taking me to an elderly woman who offered me hiding places. Houses were burning and reports of these were rampant. The following day, they came to kill me as they discovered my hidden spot. However, when a mason, a well-known individual and two soldiers spotted me, they decided not to kill me immediately, but instead reserved me for their comrades. Women were subjected to rape every day. We reminded hiding there for a month and a half, but when we eventually had to leave, 12 of our group were mercifully killed. They spared me with a different intent to hand me over the soldiers. Close to our location, there were mass graves where people were callously thrown day and night. Whenever they caught sight of us, they would cruelly label us as raped women. As hostages, we were compelled to carry heavy pots of scalding food. It caused my hair to fall out from the constant weight on my head. Eventually, we managed to escape to the Congo alongside my cousin, but tragically, she died on the way. Upon our return to Rwanda, I received news that my mother was alive. The soldiers of the Rwandan Patriotic Front generously provided us with a car to reach our home. Devastatingly, all our positions, including our fields, were destroyed and food was scarce. We received assistance from both the government and NGOs. I hated life. I didn't want to go back to school. I felt it was a waste of time because all the educated people had been killed. And then you, you went to school. From 1994 to 2001, I didn't want to talk to people. I didn't want to do anything, but I liked going to church and praying, because that's what my father did. My father once told me that if you survive the genocide, be strong and work hard. I was lucky, because the state helped us go back to school. I continued from where I left off. Here, I succeeded and went further. On the eve of graduation, my mother fell seriously ill and I had to stop my studies for a year and a half. Then again, I continued and accomplished even greater results, eventually earning admission to the university. However, the true source of my happiness came when I gave birth to my first child in 2000. That's why I did my best to go to school and study so that I could provide my child a good life. Then I had a second child and then a third. You loved you, I mean, that husband. I know that uh, he passed away, but um, when you lived together, he understood all of your feelings. He always uh, helped you. My husband was also a survivor of the genocide, and he understood me deeply. We have three daughters, one of whom is attending boarding school while the others live with me. I take pride in the fact that I have been able to overcome difficulties and face challenges without railing on others for help. I have managed to build my own life without asking for someone's help. Tutsis 
blamed the Tutsis and the Tutsis blamed the Hutus for the Rwandan genocide, but both sides strongly claim that France bears overwhelming responsibility for this genocide. At that time, the official Paris backed ethnic Hutu president Juvenal Habyarimana, who was in power. Habyarimana engaged in negotiations with the Tutsis to end the civil war, leading to the signing of Arusha Agreement. However, he was soon assassinated when the plane he was in was shot down by a missile near Kigali. In this assassination, the president of Burundi and six French crew members on board lost their lives. Houthi media alleged that the plane was shot down on the orders of Paul Kagame, the leader of the Rwandan Patriotic Front. Some speculated that Hutu militians from Habyarimana's party orchestrated the plot to fuel further anti-Tutsi violence. In the 2006 French investigation, Paul Kagame was held responsible for the murder. In response, Kagame stated that France was attempting to conceal its own involvement in the genocide. Additionally, it's a documented fact that Jean Kambanda who served as the Prime Minister of the Interim Government after the assassination of the Rwandan President in 1994, convened the leaders of Hutu power political parties on the morning of the genocide, April 8, to form the government. This meeting took place within the premises of French Embassy in Rwanda under the supervision of Ambassador Jean-Pierre Marlaud. This memorial complex pays tribute to 10 Belgian soldiers. On April 7, 1994, the first day of the genocide, these soldiers were brutally shot and killed by Hutu extremists. The perpetrators intended to provoke the withdrawal of UN forces from the country. The bullet marks from the tragic event still remain as a haunting reminder. Intentions were realized as UN mission in Rwanda was significantly reduced from 2,500 to 250 personnel. The identity of those responsible for this provocative act remains unknown. During the genocide, France conducted evacuations of its military personnel and citizens. They forcefully separate the French and Rwandan couple and do not allow them to take the children born from them to France. Tutsis who wanted to get into the trucks of French soldiers were forcefully disembarked and killed. Tutsis who tried to enter the gate of the then French embassy were also killed. All this happens in front of the eyes of the French soldiers who calmly watch the terrible scene. William Ansel, a veteran of the French army who served in the Rwanda during the genocide, says in his memoirs that France disguised its military operation under the guise of a humanitarian mission in order to conceal its support for the individuals responsible for the genocide. This sword or large knife, known as the Mashadi, was one of the most prevalent cold weapons used throughout the 100 days of the genocide. In a disturbing revelation, it's discovered that Felician Kabuga, a wealthy multimillionaire with close ties to the government at that time, had ordered 25 tons of these weapons in November 1993. The mentioning of 54 whosoever eat as the fat of the beast alludes to Kabuga's alleged involvement in supporting and instigating the violence. After the genocide, Kabuga fled to France to evade justice.
The name of this hotel is the Hotel des Miles Collines. It has gained worldwide fame not only within Rwanda and Kigali, but across the globe. During the genocide, a staggering 1,268 Tutsis found refuge within its walls. The hotel's manager, Paul Ruzesabagina, bravely hid and protected these Tutsis, steadfastly refusing to surrender even under immense pressure. Consequently, Paul Ruzesabagina's heroic actions garnered widespread recognition, culminating the creation of the renowned film Hotel Rwanda, which portrays his extraordinary story. My name is Paul Rusesabagina. I am the house manager of the most luxurious hotel in the capital of Rwanda. Daddy, there are soldiers on the streets. We've got trouble at the gate. This is a four-star hotel, not a refugee camp. I have no means to protect these people. United Artists presents the true story of a man who fought impossible odds. Hotel Rwanda. During the genocide, about 1,000 Tutsis took refuge in this church. They thought that it's God's house and the Hutus won't kill them. The priest can save them for three, four days, but after three to four days, they are all killed. Hoping that they will be maybe saved uh, or uh, escape uh, from uh, those killings, but unfortunately they were killed because the planner of the genocide has a plan, had a plan to kill all Tutsis. So even priests in those churches have been killed. Even priests, even sisters, nuns, they were killed because uh, being in a church like this one. Doesn't, didn't mean anything in front of all those killers because the plan was about to kill people. And at that time, uh, who was the uh, religious person in this church? Who? Who was? I mean, that in this church? In this church, where there were two priests, two priests from uh, Croatia. From Croatia, the Europeans, they were here. The parish priest was supposed to be the chief and the assistant priest. But uh, it doesn't mean anything because they were also they, there was a threat eh, to kill them also. So they couldn't do anything to, 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 to help people. They tried, but without success. This priest uh, from Croatia weren't killed. They, they are now in, in, in their country. And they come uh, to pray together. They come because uh, after genocide, uh, certainly, people were, some of them were psychologically uh, weak be, due to, the, to, to that genocide. But uh, after genocide, they have, in our country, we, have, we had a chance to, to have people who helped, who helped for reconciliation. Huh? It's a big work with uh, many difficulties, but for, fortunately, uh, now people are trying to live together.
Before genocide, uh, people know you are a Tutsi, you are a Hutu, you are a Twa. Now, no Tutsi, no Twa note, we are Rwandans. Do you, you as a teachers, uh, speak about genocide to the people? Yeah, we, we talk about genocide, especially in the primary. Uh, it is in the social studies. There is a topic it uh, talks about, uh, about genocide. How was the genocide? We were prepared during the genocide and then after genocide, not able our young generation to not to do again genocide. And what is your advice, your people? Yeah, nowadays I can teach them to love each, each other. When there is a love, you cannot uh, think bad things to your classmates, your co-workers, your colleagues, like that. Love first and then do. Since Rwanda is a former Belgian colony, it adopted French as an official language. However, the Rwandan genocide of 1994 had negative impact on the status of the language among the Rwandan people. The involvement of the French in the genocide led to attempts by the Rwandan people to completely distance themselves from French and Francophone influences. Currently, only about 0.1% of the Rwandan population, mostly the educated individuals, speak French. What uh, was the role of radio media during the genocide? Mm. Yeah, I know that uh, the first day in genocide in the radio was hate speech. It also means that separate. Mm. Okay, I guess the genocide of forces, the genocide of forces created even a private radio station to spread more hate among the people, uh, making, even making um, cartoons, drawings, uh, drawing Tutsis as a snakes, giving Tutsis like the tail as a, this, the body is the tail, but the head is the head of the Tutsi. And then they would say, if you wanted to kill a snake, you hit the head. Do you understand? In brief, that's how it happened. The killers during the genocide, they had, in one hand, they had the machetes, grenades. In the other hand, they had the small radios, radio receiver. So listening to music, listening to messages, listening to people who were uh, pointing out where Tutsis were hiding, saying, look at this place, look at the other place. So they are there. They are in bushes, they are in forest, in this forest. So kill them all, kill, kill them all. They were inciting people to smoke weed, smoke marijuana. Uh, cockroaches. cockroaches, yes. You know how people kill cockroaches? So you you step on it, and then you, you know, you, you splash it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My uh, next question, uh, why the international community, especially France, uh, refused to help? Wow. France did not refuse to help only they did not only refuse to help, to help, but they helped the killers. They trained the militia. France was close to the genocidal government. So are you helping your friend or you helping his enemies? So the Tutsi were 
described as enemies of Habzaliman's regime. So that is the Tutsi were enemies of friends. So that's how, why the friends trained militias since 1991 in Herami militia. France trained them. Yeah. Can you say now Francophone and Franco Africa now finished in Rwanda? Uh, no. No, because, uh, so you know the history, the history of genocide is just a parenthesis. 2019 declared, uh, declared a report, Professor declared a report where they admitted their, their responsibility in genocide. Uh, they admitted to certain uh, mistakes, they say. Maybe they did not say we, we did participate in the genocide, but we did we so we confess our own responsibility in blindly helping the genocidal government of Abjanimana. Do you agree with this uh, report? Your country, I mean, that everything is can we say that is, it was objective? Okay, there are certain uh, many positive points in the report but there are still some dark uh, uh, spaces in the report. Uh, that's why we have our own report, the Muse report, the Muse report. Rwandan, also it's accessible online, you can read it. Uh, about genocide, about the role of France. Uh, but both the reports, the, we are a big country, you know, we. We can't say in Africa that we did that, exactly what we did. That's what I think. Can we say that the Rwandan government can demand uh, to work again joint commission? So that I don't know. That I don't know if they will. <laughs> but it's something when you have someone now working together, the truth it's very simple. When the genocide ended, uh, millions fled. Almost two million, or a little bit more than two millions fled in neighboring countries, including the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Burundi, Tanzania, and Uganda. Only the the then Zaire, the, the actually now it's called Democratic Republic of the Congo, but before in back in 1994 it was called the Zaire. Let's say if you have a, a, you Azerbaijan country, so you're receiving refugees. Are you receiving them with their guns? That's what the president of the former Zaire did. So those people, they formed a country, a small country, another Rwanda, into their own country. Superpowers like America, the United States of America. Because they have uh, their own interest there. They don't tell the world, they use their media to spread confusion. To say, Rwanda is backing M23. Uh, Rwanda is attacking because of minerals, but they will never say that uh, more than 90% of the companies operating the Congo are Canadian, Australian, American. Social Paris responses to the genocide accusations in different years have been inconsistent. For instance, in 2015, then-President Francois Hollande, for instance, in 2015, then-President Francois Hollande announced that opening of the Rwandan archives. Official Paris responses to genocide accusation in different years have been inconsistent. For instance, in 2015, the President Francois Hollande announced the opening of the Rwandan archives. However, two years later, when a researcher requested permission to examine them, the French Constitutional Council decided that archives would remain secret. In May 
2019, the current president Emmanuel Macron initiated the establishment of a 15-person commission with the purpose of investigating and providing clarity on the events that took place in Rwanda between 1990 and 1994. Following a comprehensive two-year investigation, the Commission's Ducla report was published in 2021. The report contained a concise statement that France feels guilty for not fulfilling its moral and intellectual responsibility. During his visit to Rwanda in May 2021, French President Macron, in his speech at the Genocide Memorial, admitted his country's responsibility for the genocide. However, he did not apologize for that. The silent yearning for justice emanates from the eyes of the Rwandans who have patiently awaited it from the international community for 29 long years. Even to this day, human remains continue to emerge in great numbers from the Rwandan soil. A pervasive silence hangs over the nation as the people find it difficult to discuss this delicate tragedy, holding on to the hope that such horror will never befall on their homeland again. However, as long as the perpetrators of the genocide remain unpunished, a resounding cry will forever persist amidst the silence that envelops this place. In the virtual world, there are countless online games that revolve around colonialism. There are more than 10,000 games that are related to colonialism. The appearances of games may vary, but the goal and content remain the same. Even though the official information obtained from Paris says that Frank Afrique era, the era of oppression on the colonies, has come to an end in real world, the intention and policy of colonization continue in virtual realms and political games. In Rwanda, however, children go to school for the sake of their own and their country's future. Özlerinin ve ülkelerinin geleceği için.